This excellent medical student-led podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as medical advice under any circumstance. Welcome back, everyone. We're here at Northwestern for episode 23. Excited to be back behind the mic for another clinical unknown case. We have two new discussants we're excited to introduce, but I have Lauren joining us again to lead her second episode with us. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Kevin. Really happy to be here and excited to go through our next case together. We have two wonderful co-students of mine joining us today. I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Phoebe. What are you interested in, Phoebe? I'm going to internal medicine. I'm really interested in allergy Ooh. and infectious disease. Those okay. are kind of my two favorites. And anything you like to do outside of medicine? I'm really into painting as a hobby. What kind of painting? Like Acrylic painting and watercolor are my two Wonderful. favorite. That's awesome. Very cool. And hi, everyone. My name is Chen. I'm also a fourth year medical student. I'm also going to internal medicine, interested in critical care and cardiology. Very different from Phoebe. It's okay. We're good friends outside. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and outside of medicine, I recently start to boulder. It's very fun. It's a great sense of accomplishment when you finish a route and some problem solving and just cool people meeting with cool people where do you boulder in illinois oh i like first ascent that's like yeah. the closest spot but also tried movement as well nice have you gotten the calluses yet i feel like that's key a little bit yeah yeah <laughs> awesome all right so should we get started with our case then sounds good cool so this is a 29 year old man who presented with acute right eye erythema it started one week ago it spontaneously resolved after four days, but has now returned. He does not have any associated pain or change in visual acuity. Starting off with this case, note that uh, it's kind of acute and also recurrent in nature. It looks like it resolved and then came back. I would like to know more about the other associate. Like, is there any discharge? And it looks like it's unilateral as well. Yeah, I think those are, are great components to pick up from this initial presentation. Any thoughts you want to add to that, Phoebe? The fact that there's no pain or change in visual acuity yeah. also like, eliminates a lot of things that we would classically think of. Yeah. What does that change about your differential then? No pain. I'd think a lot less about like infection or at least something bacterial, something really bad mm -hmm. without any pain at all. Like no change in visual acuity would also get rid of like optic neuritis. Oh, you, wouldn't, you don't get a red eye for that, do you? I don't I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah. And then the unilaterality is interesting. I would think about autoimmune if it's bilateral, but, you know, patients don't read textbooks, so they can present <laughs> however they want. They don't. <laughs> I think those are all great points. And how you kind of took pieces of the little that you were given and dissected it into some understandable parts of like how to kind of narrow things already. So you're already saying there's some unilaterally unilaterality to this. There's an acute tempo to this. And there's no pain. So I think you together combine those three. And I feel like I already have an understanding of where you're kind of at, where your thinking is directed. So nice job. High stuff is scary. I like <laughs> talking to Lauren before we started and reading opto notes, all these acronyms. Yeah. I don't understand yeah. what they are. And then like calling an opto consult on this, I'd be yeah. like, yeah. This guy has like a red eye. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't hurt. <laughs> what else they, I always, be doing? they can't do anything because like they, they need you to send them to the clinic. clinic. <laughs> awesome. Anything else that you're thinking about before we move on to the next bit of information? Any specific things on your differential? You said you're less concerned about something autoimmune, maybe less concerned about something infectious could still always be infection. Mm -hmm. Anything can be infection. <laughs> just want to know maybe some trauma history if there's any. Yeah. Like this is or if he's doing anything to his eye. Yeah. Yeah, like common things being common, right? Like is mm -hmm. using eye drops or something. Like is this something yeah. contact related? Was he hitting the eye? Yeah. <laughs> like, or is this something that's not related to the eye? Maybe something yeah. around the eye that Great. causes problems to the eye? Yeah. Let's not anchor on the eye. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. We also don't have that much information about where the erythema is from this. So I, I always thought eye anatomy was really challenging, but there's so many components. Yeah. So just the fact that we know there's erythema, it could be a lot of different things, but sure, anatomically. All right. Should we move on to the next part? So pressing to know the next part. <laughs> All right. 
So this man has a past medical history significant for HIV. Three weeks ago, he had a dinophagia. Liquids and solids and pills were getting stuck in his throat. He does not have any associated fever, chills, weight loss, diarrhea, constipation, or rashes. He does have a non-productive cough and has noticed occasional blood-streaked stools. Wow, this is just opening up to a lot of things here. <laughs> you were about to say, let's not anchor on the eye. I know. <laughs> so with the history of HIV, that opens up the door to a lot of cancer, malignancy things, as well as a lot of other infections that would be very unusual in someone else who's like a young, healthy person. Yeah. Any in particular you're thinking of? <laughs> CMV, get esophagitis with that. When it says start cold, must start with a K. Kaposi said, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Always. Because you're more susceptible like Canada. Yeah. Esophagitis too. Something that's always stuck with me. I don't know where I heard it first, but immunocompromised patients are at risk of getting the same exact infectious things that you and I are, but we do expand our differential. But mm -hmm. with common things being common, it's more likely to be the community acquired type stuff mm -hmm. than it is to be the more es esoteric board exam mm -hmm. stuff. But mm -hmm. this is a, a case for an episode of a podcast. <laughs> 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 Not saying anything more, but how do you guys take what we got here and use that to kind of frame your work up going forward? I think like like you said, definitely opening up to some testings that I would not otherwise consider in immunocompetent patients with this association with odinophagia, blood streaked stools, thinking of some if we're thinking about infectious, thinking about some virus that could affect both the eyes and the esophagus and the rest of the body, like CMZ, AB. And non-productive cough could be a lot of things, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of things cause a cough. Yeah. <laughs> and this patient has a lot of a lot of other stuff going on, too. So it sounds like, Chen, what I'm hearing from you is you're starting to think about how all of these different symptoms might fit together for, for sure patient. for sure chen's and occam's razor belief oh yeah you're <laughs> differentiating those two <laughs> yeah <laughs> or there's the other one that i always forget what it's called where they, yeah, yeah where they can have as many problems as they exactly. want exactly i i believe both are true <laughs> in different circumstances <laughs> anything else you're thinking about Phoebe? for i think in general we're kind of moving more towards a something systemic something that affects a lot of things kind of looking at that first I like how you're keeping it broad. I think that's important. I commit many, to nothing. Yeah. <laughs> for any reason. Like you're not near, like locking yourself out of other pieces of information. It sounds like you're keeping everything in mind and trying to tie them in, but also thinking more broadly. I think it's a great way to approach this case. One thing I want to zoom in on, we talked about the eye symptoms for this patient. If we think about a dinophagia in an HIV positive patient, what do you think about? How do you approach that? I think a lot about the various infections you can get that can really hit you harder there. Like I think we said CMV, I don't know, mono, mm -hmm. like EBT, mono, Canada, and probably other like small esophagitis that just gets way worse if you're immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. I'd think a little bit less about some like solid malignancies like esophageal cancer but always like still possible with yeah. hiv it's just not something that i would immediately jump to as like oh this is the classic association what would you want to do about the dinophagia for this patient i just clarify was it he he had an episode of it and then like it went away or it sounds like maybe this was an isolated episode but unclear if he's still experiencing these symptoms mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think if we go off of things that we are thinking of, we can send off some infectious workup. If that come back negative, we can go down the road of some imaging as well to look at the area. If we're thinking about any solid malignancy at all, <laughs> that could be like, if he was like, definitely if he was still having some of this and getting food stuck in his throat and had any other concerning things, like I'm choking on my food, I'm coughing it back up, mm -hmm. then I would be more like aggressive about saying we should get some imaging, like yeah. get GI involved to do EGD, like look directly or esophagram. We could, I would kind of want to 
make sure we've got that on like under control because mm-hmm. we don't want him to aspirate things into his lung and yeah. make that non-productive cough worse. See, <laughs> be thinking about patient safety, yeah. <laughs> aspiration risk. <laughs> yeah, I think those are are really great things to be thinking about. And one point that I did want to bring up is, so let's say you want to talk to GI. This, say this patient's still having these symptoms. You're going to talk to GI. Is there anything you'd want to do in the meantime? In my experience, I feel like they usually like to see like some esophageal imaging first because it can often be easy enough to get before they go down there if you're looking for some things. So I kind of want to do that. I want to know a lot more about exactly the details of what is it like only certain foods that it's happening with? Because yeah. then if someone had that, then maybe say, oh, maybe you just have EOE now and something else going on as well. He was um, ready to take a good history. <laughs> It's the future allergy ID. <laughs> yeah, I guess what what does the future hospital infectious disease specialist want to know more about their HIV history? What kind of things do you want to know about someone's HIV history? I'd want to know what medications, like when he was diagnosed, if he's ever had any complications from it, and all the other things like CD4 yeah. count and whatnot. That mm-hmm. Kind of want to get a picture of where they fall in the spectrum of how worried we should be about exactly. immune status. Exactly. So this patient was diagnosed with HIV 10 years ago. He's unsure of his CD4 count or a recent viral load. He had been on Truvada, but stopped one year ago because of GI side effects. He has never had HIV-related illness. He was diagnosed with secondary syphilis at the time of his HIV diagnosis, but has had complete treatment. In terms of his social history... He drinks one pint of vodka per day, has never had withdrawal symptoms, no tobacco use. As far as his sexual history, he does have sex with men, had a single partner for about 18 months, four partners in total, intermittent condom use, no sex trading. This patient is a student. He also has a cat. He does have a recent history of domestic travel throughout the U.S., but no international travel. So now with the more information about the HIV, looks like he's not, he has been treated in the past, but recently not been treated. We don't know his CD4 count, but based off that he's not being treated for a year, probably not super great. He has had HIV related, he has never had HIV related illness. Doesn't mean that he won't have it now. That's sort of what I take from his past medical history from the HIV standpoint. Yeah. Heavy drinker. Yeah. It's definitely. Does that change your dinophagia or concern with the dinophagia at all? Yeah, because then I always worry about all the other things that happen if you're like, if you drink a lot of alcohol, yeah. get yourself a little bit of trauma to there. Borals, Mallory White. Yeah, yeah. Or just it's off chose. Yeah. Oh. It's irritation from. Also noting like intermittent condom use, you always want that always opens you up to a whole bunch of sexually transmitted infections, especially. You know, if you are immune compromised, things yeah. can just get out of control way faster. It's always interesting to see that the pet is pointed out. <laughs> could be nothing, could be something. <laughs> Keeping it in the back of our mind. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? I, I mean, nothing about this is screaming. Oh, this is, oh, gosh, Barton. <laughs> <laughs> but you never know. What do you think about the timeline for the HIV diagnosis? What does that mean to be 10 years out? Or how do you think of the phases of, of HIV and, and AIDS? Correct me if I'm wrong. I think the beginning couple of months or years, you consider it being like the acute phase and then going out, you could be more like chronic, well-controlled range, and people can be there for a really long time if they're under treatment. So that's kind of where he fits at this moment. If he'd been on Truvada for whole 10 years, that would be very different than yeah. the one who said I was diagnosed 10 years ago, wasn't on any meds for eight years, and then did Trubata for one year before stopping. For sure. Yeah, and to, to add to that a little bit to our understanding of the phases with HIV infection as a teaching point. So as you mentioned, Chen, there's the acute phase, which is within several weeks after infection with HIV, and then you move towards the chronic phase after seroconversion, where you mentioned you might be asymptomatic for a while and be fairly clinically stable. One really important thing to think about that I learned a little bit more about looking this up is how important the viral load set point is. 
I don't know, Phoebe, if you are ID interested, if that's something <laughs> you feel like you can talk about or I can share more. I'm not sure what the set point part yeah. means. Yeah. I know I've just heard, you know, everyone always wants to know, like, HIV, CD4 count, what's your viral load? Because yeah. that tells you a lot about how, in, like, CD4 count would tell you more about, like, their risk for certain things happening to them, like, how immunocompromised they are, whereas the viral load would kind of tell you more about how much are they producing? Yeah. Like, how risk, how much of risk are they to infect someone else? Good. Yeah, I think that's great. I kind of think of it as the CD4 count is where you're at. And the viral load is where you're going. Wonderful. So the viral load set point is usually determined by about six months after infection. And so that is kind of your starting point for where your viral load will increase from there. And then also how your CD4 count will decline from there. Mm -hmm. And it's actually really important in terms of clinical prognosis. So a higher set point is associated with a greater rate of progression of disease. Do you know is the set point, is there any risk factors for a higher set point to begin yeah. with? It sounds like the set point is kind of, you have this point and then it kind of determined your future. So I wonder for patients who have better prognosis because they have better set point, is there any specific characteristics about them that make them yeah. having better prognosis, if you know of? I'm not sure. That's a great question because it's, then really risk strategy yeah, and then that. identifying opportunities to for sure. reduce risk for yeah. patients. Yeah, I'd have to look that up. Yeah, interesting that question. I don't know either, but I love that question. I w I'm, imagine it's multifactorial for, for sure. sure. I wonder if like mm -hmm. HIV serotype plays into it. Other like comorbidities, I'm sure, play into it. Really good question though. And then thinking a little bit more about chronic things for HIV. So you can have HIV without AIDS at that point. And then once your CD4 count goes to below 200 or you have an AIDS defining illness, then we classify that as AIDS. And in the absence of antiretroviral therapy, the average time from acquiring HIV to then having a CD4 count less than 200. So being diagnosed with AIDS is approximately eight to 10 years. So interesting. We had this patient. Yeah. 10 years out, has been on treatment, but maybe intermittently. So I think you all are thinking about exactly the right things for, for our patient. And interestingly too, HIV, especially when it's treated with antiretroviral therapy, now we think of it much more as a chronic disease state oh, sure. rather than, you know, this, this acute illness and poor prognosis. So very exciting, Phoebe, if you do choose to do ID or. <laughs> Yeah, it's good news for patients for sure. So we have some vitals for you all. Blood pressure is 113 over 83. Pulse is 130. Temperature 100.7. Respiratory rate is 18. Oxygen saturation is 99% on room air. The exam in general, he's resting in the hospital bed wearing normal clothes. His eye is erythematous in the right conjunctiva. He has bloody tears on the right eye and scleral hemorrhage. There's also mild erythema of the left conjunctiva. He has purple macules scattered on the hard and soft palate and some shoddy submandibular lymphadenopathy. He's breathing comfortably, slightly decreased breath sounds on the right without any wheezing. He has regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs. His abdomen is soft, non tentopatosplint but does have some inguinal lymphadenopathy. No lower extremity edema. He's alert and oriented and does not have any focal neurodeficits. So our unilateral eye thing is maybe not so unilateral. <laughs> <laughs> some things that I feel like stand out. The purple macules on hard and soft palate. Always worry about Kaposi's related things. Hey. Anytime I hear anything purple. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on the head with this and having like lymphadenopathy both like in your head area and as well as like an inguinal region yeah it always kind of tells you mm -hmm. something's spread as we going back to vitals being vital he's tachycardic and his temperature isn't in the fever range but it's high on the higher end He's a little bit fever. He's febrile. He's got, got a fever. fever. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing insane, but he does have a little fever. 
mm-hmm. met our criteria for the stores. I always like to ask when we're looking at vitals, sick or not sick. I think it's our first differentiator. Do you have time to think or do we got to start acting? Mm-hmm. Not that sick, I would say. His general appearance also looks pretty well. Not well, but he's not, you know, trying to jump off of the bed or look really lethargic or anything like that. His oxygen saturation is good. His blood pressure is good. He's not like breathing really fast. Maybe not his heart rate. Fast. Don't need to rush him to the MICU yeah. right now. <laughs> I agree. We got time. I will say sinus tech scares me. Mm-hmm. It, you can't fake sinus tech. There's always a reason. Yeah. And his heart's beating that fast. Mm-hmm. I think we have that reason. They're febrile. We mm-hmm. have to figure out why. The eye findings are very interesting. I don't know what I would do. I'm seeing this patient for the first time. Obviously, I'm calling ophthalmology, asking what they might be able to weigh in and things I can do. But is take something, pictures. <laughs> yeah, with something. Yeah, definitely adding pictures. Where are you thinking, Lauren? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you all. Not sick at the moment, but I'm not terribly reassured. I would say, especially, you know, he wasn't having any complaints of dyspnea, but now. Slightly decreased breath sounds on the right, and also combination with the tachycardia. So mm. I'm not I'm not necessarily reassured, but I agree, Phoebe. We don't need to rush him to the NICU. He should be admitted. If this is an ED, <laughs> I wouldn't I wouldn't love for him to go home. <laughs> I think that's that's a good call. What are you guys going to focus on for your workup now? Maybe I'm just thinking of this because the eye, anything eye scares me. Yeah. I want to just get up though, like yeah. on board as soon as possible. Cause I don't, even though he's not having pain or like problems with his visual acuity right now, I don't know how quickly it could go that way. Right. And if like, there's something we need to do now to stop that from happening. So because I know nothing about the eyes, I'd want to get up though. And to know if there's something we should be doing right now. Right. We'll get up though. What are you going to do while they bring all their equipment over? <laughs> <laughs> Let's get some chest x-ray with the, the right. long funding. We'll send some, send some infectious workup. Generally, what things are you including for that, like a broad infectious workup? Yeah. So like, like a CM, a CMV, EBV, like specific, like immunocompromised pan- related panels. I want blood cultures. Blood cultures. I know people have different takes about adding UAs to every infectious workup, yeah. but I'm fine doing it in this case. It's easy and cheap. <laughs> yeah, we can debate that another time. Yeah. <laughs> we don't have that much time to think about it. What about yeah, his he's... history of HIV? Are we going to oh, well, we check out some stuff there? CD4 count and viral loads. And then he's going to get some imaging. It's yeah, yeah. more aggressive. He's going to get. And once his chest x ray, are we scanning him elsewhere? Kind of hard because he's got so much going on. Yeah. From, like head to toe. And no one's going to let you just. Order a pan scan full body. <laughs> he may end up getting pan scanned <laughs> in the end with all of the imaging that he may end up accumulating, depending on whatever it is. But mm-hmm. are you thinking of like a CT app in pelvis or it's with the di- I'm just thinking of with the diffused lymphadenopathy. What yeah. am I? What if I? If I'm thinking of malignancy, what right. what am I going to do with it? And if I can't. What being points to one source, then I might just scan everything so that I Interesting. find, look for something. I don't know. It might be. Not, I like your thought process. Yeah. You're thinking like, what am I going to do if I order something? Yeah. Yeah. That's guess, an important thing to keep in mind for sure. Choosing wisely, people may not agree with me, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess my thought is, would you want to do one thing at a time? Would you want to get multiple things at once? What would your approach be? Mm-hmm. I think he has multiple things going on, so I'm fine with go- doing multiple things at a time. If I know eventually I will get to is, get to that anyways, and also I will have to address every findings I'm looking at. Yeah, I'm also like, in terms of categorizing like how, what imaging I would want first, like I'd be more worried about the things in his head right now. Like, is he having some tumors that are like metastasizing? Like mass invasion and that's what's causing like his eye problems whereas like even though he's having like inguinal lymphadenopathy i'm not like as worried about stuff in the pelvis right yeah. now so if i was to image i'd be like let's start near near the brain yeah. okay like sounds that. like you're worried about his vision maybe yes i'm worried about his vision i'm worried about like how fast things move there yeah i'd co-sign that <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna talk to opto 
I know Kevin has a, a nice teaching point here about some things to think about and let Opto know when you give him a call. So the four things Oppo really wants to know are the acuity, the pupils, the fields of vision, and then the extraocular movements. So if you're calling a consult and you have an eye complaint and you have those four things ready, I think you're setting up that consult <laughs> for success. They're going to be happy with you. They generally are anyways, but I think that will help them in kind of determining what they can actually help with. All right. So we got some labs back. We got a chem panel. Sodium is 136, potassium 4.1, chloride 102, bicarb is 25, BUN 17, creatinine 1.15, glucose is 112, calcium 7.2. We got some liver testing. AST is 26, ALT 19, ALKFOS is 19 as well. The T Billy 0.9, albumin 3.9, and then of course we got a CBC. So the white count is 3.1. It's 65% neutrophils. Hemoglobin is 13.2. Platelets are 70. Looking at this panels of labs, I think from the chemistry part of it, mostly most things look pretty good. We don't have a baseline for his creatinine, but 1.15 isn't terrible. The liver panels, the liver panel also looks pretty good. What stands out to me is his CBC. I think that Y count of 3.1 is low. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong. I think playlist of 70 also is on the lower side too. Don't love that. Always worry more about bleeding <laughs> and all those things. He's having bloody tears. You're seeing multiple low playlets. Oh, this is not good. Is there a calcium is kind of low? Not the thing that's going to kill him, right? At the second, but. That's the future internist in you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about your supplements. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised at these labs. I was like expecting a lot worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not, it's pretty discordant for me. I do, th I think we gen both, uh, we all picked up on the bicytopenia as kind of being the salient feature of this labs and mm -hmm. otherwise pretty unremarkable. Anything else you're thinking about with this bicytopenia, this thrombocytopenia in particular? I know, Phoebe, you talked about you're worried about bleeding. Anything else on your differential for this patient, for these cytopenias? I can tell you more about what the things that could be happening are. Like it could be, obviously, malignancies always mess with all of your cell count. Also, in terms of narrowing down, if you were still thinking like infection, CMB, you get thrombocytopenia. I may be imagining that. Sounds right. But, <laughs> you get a little bit of that. I'm trying not to anchor on the CMB. I think I saw the a couple things and that was what stood out. But I'm not the biggest hemonc person, but is there any like leukemia things that will give you a panel like that's similar like this? Any cytopenia. Yeah. In the right demographic, for sure. Yeah. I'm saying that his hemoglobin is like, yeah, he's good. Especially because everyone in the hospital is not even good, right? <laughs> so he's almost been here long enough. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, right? Yeah. It's weird seeing someone who's not anemic. Mm -hmm. What about the HIV? How does that or could that relate to this thrombocytopenia? So I can help you out here. Thank you. So. <laughs> Anemia, leukopenia, lymphopenia, and thrombocytopenia can all be found in patients with HIV. Specifically, they are found in over 40% of patients who have a CD4 count less than 200. Mm -hmm. So we can add that to our differential. So, yeah. We don't have a CD4 yet, but mm -hmm. you were looking at some A's range. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say if it comes back in a very high normal range, I'll be surprised. <laughs> we have a lot of questions. So we have a lot of things we want to find out. All right. Should we get some more information? It's good. Yeah. So we got that chest x-ray that you wanted. Can you describe what you're seeing for our listeners since they won't be able to see this in front of them? Yes. So first of all, no devices or lines that I can see. Airway is patent and in and midline. 
bones. I don't see any fractures. I'm also not looking at the screen super closely, but I would assume no fractures. The cardiac silhouette looks pretty normal to me. The diaphragm, I can see the left side, the costophrenic angle pretty well. The right side was a little murphy, and I don't see frank effusion. I do see maybe consolidations on the right lower lobe and maybe right upper lobe as well at the base. And then the hilum looks a little congested to me. That was a great read. Wow. Pat. <laughs> <laughs> One that was so systematic. I love it. I feel like everyone listening to this will be able to see this image in their head of what we're looking at right now. I think you painted the perfect picture. Um, the only thing I would add is I, I do agree that something is going on with the hilum. Mm. Congestion versus consolidation versus just some overall fluffiness. I'm not sure. Mm. I've heard a term thrown around lately on rounds like a bunch of schmutz in the line. Okay. <laughs> That's a better word. A technical <laughs> term. I've seen some Hyler schmutz. Okay. <laughs> How does this compare to our physical exam? I think it lines up with the physical exam. I remember we had decreased breath sounds on the right side, and he's, he's still breathing well, so moving airs and setting well. So lo location-wise, it's kind of, it kind of yeah. lines up. Mm -hmm. And also that there's nothing enormous, huge on here where you'd be like, oh, wow, I'm surprised you're still statting 99%. Uh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like everything here. Like there's stuff here, mm -hmm. but nothing that would scream mm -hmm. like pulmonary problem right this second. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to do next? Are we still waiting for our consult to come to us? We called Apado. They're on their way. Not here quite yet. I'm feeling like we're going to be getting a CT chest <laughs> to characterize this better. So yeah. Because like we're saying, we could tell there's stuff there, but what it is exactly, we don't know. Exactly. It's like high-res CT chest to look at that. And I'm okay with just starting with just the chest. And then if we decide we want to move on to the rest of the body, can do that later. And now we're going to real, we're going to step out of the case discussion and go into the real world. We're on the ward. This chest x-ray just came back. You're faced with the question, are you going to start this person on antibiotics? They're febrile. They have a history of HIV. We have some junk in their lungs. Mm -hmm. What are we doing? I would start with some antibiotics. I'll call my ID friends to tell me which one <laughs> I would yeah. do. But I might, I might actually start broad at this moment yeah. since we won't have any, we don't have any speciation at this moment. And he's also immunocompromised. So I'll start pretty broad. Good. He's like the classic of <laughs> vancozin, yeah, and then get mercenaries and see if you can just take the vinc away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that I think that is the answer. Actually, mm -hmm. like that is what will, or more than likely, will happen. Uh, I guess the alternative would be like, could you cover this person with just community acquired pneumonia coverage? But we, they're immunocompromised to some degree. We don't know how immunocompromised they are yet because we're still waiting on that CD4. So I don't think you could get away with that. I think we are going with Piptazo and Vank for this guy yeah. until we can start peeling stuff off or get some more data back. For sure. I think before we see what our consultants have to say, I like to kind of challenge both of you here to come up with the problem representation of the patient because we've gotten a lot so far. And I just want to make sure I think this is just good practice when you're faced with cases like this to kind of try to consolidate everything we've got to the, what you think to be the most important features of the case. So you guys can put your heads together and try to summarize this patient up. Yeah. Oh, he's 20, 28. 28. Something like that. It's really only medical history is just this HIV unknown status yeah. in terms of like unknown viral, unknown CD4, like not currently on medication. Mm -hmm. Who present with acute right eye erythema with hemorrhage and currently febrile and tachycardic with Lung, right lung consolidation and diffuse lymphopathy and macular sling, the soft palate, hard soft, hard yeah. soft palate. Got a lot going on. He does. You know, let's see what the ophthalmologist thought. Right. Opso came. They did an excellent exam for us. The visual acuity is normal. Pupils, there's no afferent pupillary defect. Visual fields are full bilaterally. He has full extraocular motion or movements. He does not have any masses, soft to retropulsion, no proptosis. On the right eye, there's a mild scattered subconjunctival hemorrhage. There's also a linear vascular lesion of the inferior fornix extending towards the medial canthus. 
<laughs> We're all laughing. I don't know. <laughs> this, right? Oh, yeah. oh, oh, center. I don't know how yeah. to describe it for someone who's listening. <laughs> Medial part of your eye. Yeah. Where your eyes meet your nose. Where your, where your, yeah. <laughs> where your tears come out, I guess. Yeah. The cornea, anterior chamber, iris, and lens are all normal. The optic discs are also normal. The vessels are without hemorrhage or vasculitis. There's no active retinitis, no retinal detachments. I really don't know what they're saying, but it looks like most of the pathologies are in the conjunctiva and sclera, but everything else looks normal. Reading this, I would assume the opto is not like extremely concerned. <laughs> what do we think about, we talked about CMV retinitis. <laughs> so now a part of me is wondering if he's got this thrombocytopenia. It's really prone to bleeding. Like, did he maybe, like, is this actually some local trauma? We'll hemorrhage from that and that we would just fixate on the iron is too much when maybe it's just another source of another little bleed he's got going on because he's got bloody stool so yeah you're thinking there's some blood there i like that i'm thinking now i'm just thinking with you like he's got an extensive drinking history yeah. he's had some adinophagia mm -hmm. was he on a binge and was vomiting a lot Causing odynophagia, did he pop some vessels in his eye? We don't see that, but maybe that's the conjunctival component. And then does he have like a lower upper GI, I believe, related to his alcohol use? Does that kind of summarize everything? Maybe. Yeah. No. That sounds like a good story we could put together. Maybe that's definitely one of the possibilities here. I think like both of you, I don't, it's, this is centered on the conjunctiva. The rest is, I don't know. The no after blurry defect is okay. Probably not optic neuritis. <laughs> that was my takeaway. But yeah, I don't know. This is. It's interesting. You don't see this. So we got some more imaging and some studies. We got that CT chest that you wanted. Showed innumerable bilateral pulmonary nodules with predominantly lower lung ground glass opacities. The radiologist reads says this is concerning for an infectious process, including atypical etiologies such as mycobacterium and fungal. We also got the EGD. There was an erythematous nodule noted on the soft palate and raised areas of erythema and ulceration on the hypopharynx. There were also multiple small erythematous nodules throughout the entire esophagus, as well as the stomach and duodenum. So there's infectious process going on in the lungs. And I don't know what to make up for the many erythematous nodules in the esophagus stomach. It's like the hole from mouth to duodenum. Yeah. It's got a bunch of erythematous nodules. Yeah. yeah. And the upper <laughs> nodule. Yeah. Do you think these Did processes are related? Do you think they're different? Occam's razor, hiccup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't think of any, like, think erythematous nodules all throughout. Yeah. Your GI lim like, does not scream anything in particular to me, which is why I feel like it's kind of hard for me to say, is this related? Is this not? <laughs> I wonder if they biopsied those nodules on their way out, or maybe they didn't. Because they're afraid of... Oh. At least there's no source of bleeding, as they see on the EGD. Maybe. I think we do have, like, a unique skin finding. An erythematous nodule, I feel like, has a focused differential. What things do, are you guys thinking of? Do you still have the carpose, carpose, the sarcoma yeah. on the list? Autoimmune stuff? The chaise. <laughs> yeah, like the vasculitides. All those. How about infectious? Causing nodule? Yeah. God. I don't know anything that causes, like any infectious things causes nodules. At least not described as nodule. Some weird parasite, maybe. What about our positive cat sign? Always the cat. It's always <laughs> the cat. It's cat scratch disease. We felt it. <laughs> just wanted to throw that in there. I guess I was just thinking of like all the lymphadenopathy. Yeah. Which, I mean, that would, it does have lymphadenopathy everywhere. So that would definitely fit. Maybe the cat scratched him in his eyeball and that's where <laughs> that first came from. Everything started. Where it started. Again, kind of going back to our problem list is helpful because there's so many things that this patient has going on. So if we can think about it head to toe, he has the areas of hemorrhage in his eye. He's having difficulty swallowing. He has the lesions in his oropharynx and on his hard and soft palates. 
sounds like we're seeing them pretty diffusely. Uneasy. Hmm. He's got a lot of gunk in his lungs, to be technical. <laughs> he wanted a biopsy. I think that, that'll be helpful. Yeah. What else do we need to help figure out what's going on? Have we tested for TB yet? Mm-hmm. Test for TB, do fungal, fungal beta glucan, all the other fungal things for the area. Histo, blasto. I like the infe- infectious workup. Are we doing this non invasively? Do we need to do it invasively? He had non productive cough, so we probably don't have sputum sample from him. If we want something from the lung, we can do a bronchoscopy with all and culture that or run studies on that. Yeah. We got DI, we got Opto, let's get Palm on board. <laughs> I'm sure we have ID on board. Get them to biopsy one of those nodules. Yeah. There's so many nodules everywhere. <laughs> it's bothering. <laughs> it's, the word nodule is up on the screen like 30 times. <laughs> and it's definitely bothering him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So we also talked to Derm. They did a skin exam, found a subcutaneous flesh-colored 6-millimeter papule on the mid-chest, also a 5-millimeter violaceous papule on the right mid-upper thigh. We also, as you suggested, Shen, talked to Palm. We did a bronch and a BAL. So that came back with 108 white blood cells, 3% 3% neutrophils, 39% lymphocytes, 4% monocytes, 1% eosinophils, and there were 47 macrophages. 102,000 red blood cells. Sputum was positive for gram-negative rods. Galactomannan we got was positive at 0.72. Pneumocystis DF- DFA was negative. We did do a CMV culture that was positive. AFB is pending, and cytology is also pending. More skin things. <laughs> I'll be honest, I don't know how to interpret this cell counts and whatnot for the bronch. Yeah. Looks like he has m- multiple things come back positive, the grand negative rods, the CMV. We still have AFB pending. That's that he's definitely... Uh-huh. So he's got GNRs, <laughs> something fungal... And a CMP. And now do any of, does any of that explain these interesting erythematous nodules, papules we're seeing, or is this something else going on? Where are you I, putting your money? I feel like these rank findings does not necessarily explain the erythematous nodule. I'm going to put my money down here. Love it. I can't really think of anything that necessarily connects those. Yeah. It sounds like you're satisfied with our bronch and that we have some explanation for as to why we have those chest x-ray findings mm-hmm. in our respiratory exam. What are you thinking about the other stuff? What are you most worried about? Always malignancy. <laughs> because if it's malignancy and it's obviously affecting so much of him right now, yeah, I'm just worried it's going to be hard to really get at that. Is there any particular malignancy that you would think about? And highest on your differential. Maybe we just keep saying Kaposi. So, because <laughs> that's the, the only thing I know. <laughs> the only one that, like, oh my God, that skin sarcoma, that's related to that. Mm-hmm. I think you both did a fine job overall just sharing your reasoning, but I think you're, you guys are on the right track. And this, mm-hmm. you would have taken great care of this patient. You would have gotten to the answer. I don't know if Lauren has anything to add before we kind of reveal and talk a little bit more about what happened, but. Mm-hmm. I guess one other thing I wanted to point out from the bronch is the RBC. I'll tell you that's high. Not <laughs> knowing all of the normal values yeah. for bronx, that's, that's high. high. He's bleeding. He's ble- worried. Now I'm more worried about him when he's bleeding and he's got a lot going on in his lungs when he's bleeding and he's flares positive. He's someone who I would be worried about just like turning a corner at any second and like now he's hemorrhaging. Yeah, I guess. So are you worried now about airway protection? Based on what you're telling me, you're yeah. making me think about that. Yeah, I'm kind of worried. Now I'm worried. <laughs> yeah, it would obviously be helpful to be at the Bronx to kind of see yeah. 
how bloody this truly was, right? Like we can see it's the sample was blood. This is kind of what this says, <laughs> but to know how much would be helpful for sure about other management stuff. So, and that amount of red blood cells, you won't see it in a traumatic brunk. Yeah, that's a good question though. I don't know if we need to intubate them right this second, but be helpful to be there. I don't, I don't think we can get that answer from just the viewer. But yeah, those are the things you think about though, right? All right. I'm typing screen. Yeah. All that. <laughs> Access. <laughs> All that might not look that great in a second. <laughs> yeah. Love it. You both are doing a, an amazing job. So let's have you both put your money. What do you think the final diagnosis is? And we'll, we'll reveal it. And I'm just thinking, have we ruled out cat scratch? The cat scratch, I'm like, I was just thinking, get the lymphadenopathy you get. Yeah. Diagnosis, but I don't know quite so much. I guess I was kind of running down on one thing to unite everything. AIDS. Mm-hmm. I would assume that he's got some sort of AIDS yeah, defining thing right now. I like that. Maybe. I'm just thinking of what is still on our differential. Have we rooted out? And I don't think we have any evidence to rule it out necessarily. I think sounds like we're still most concerned about malignancy. Like malignancy that's now obviously led to him having every kind of infectious thing in his lungs he possibly can. Whereas I'm thinking, like, if it was, if this was just cat scratch, for example, like, then it'd also be weird that he also happens to have a whole host of infectious things in his lungs as well. Mm-hmm. Whereas I'm thinking, as it'd be easier to explain malignancy that's leading to, like, malignancy on top of just HIV AIDS yeah. causing you to just be so susceptible to any kind of infection. And then he can have as many infections as he wants. He can also have cat scratch. <laughs> <laughs> he can have CMV, cat scratch. Fungal infection, whatever this gene are in his lung is, all of that. I love it. I think you set the stage. An AIDS-defying illness, most likely, it sounds like you guys think it's oh. Kaposi's sarcoma. We're just, I'm comfortable just guessing Kaposi's. Yes. Right. <laughs> sarcoma. <laughs> so, final diagnosis. GI did get a biopsy that revealed Kaposi's sarcoma, HHV8 positive. And also some Giardia organisms were visualized. Mm-hmm. You can have as many infections yeah. as you want. Yeah. So. And he did. <laughs> so some infectious updates. I'll do my best to <laughs> pronounce all of these medications. So he was started on tenofovir, emtricitabine, durinavir, and ritonavir. He had prophylactic Bactrim and azithromycin. He got IV Bactrim and prednisone until the PJP DFA was negative. He got ceftriaxone and azithromycin. For his rhinovirus that he also had, he got supportive care. For the galactomannan, they ended up not treating that. He was serum negative. He got flagell for Giardia. For his latent syphilis, he got three doses of IM penicillin with follow-up. And for his AFB, one out of three were positive for MIA at two weeks. For the CMV that was seen on the bronc, he did not undergo any further treatment. He was ultimately discharged home. Any reflections? Having very good follow-up on yeah. all of your HIV patients is important. It's like if he had GI symptoms and that's why he stopped the Truvada a year ago, you know, being good if you're being seen yeah. frequently enough that someone else could immediately say, let's put you on one of the billion other ones we have because you really can't be off of it. Who do you guys think you did? We were too hesitant. To yeah, to yeah. Was the, the <laughs> I don't know how to like, say that, <laughs> but you did. You got it in the end. Yeah. You mentioned it in the second hour. <laughs> <laughs> that one again. <laughs> but I, I think importantly, you both kept your differential really broad, which is for a patient with so many things going on. I think it can be easy to just think about one thing that connects it, but you really did think about, you know, could this be something autoimmune? Can he have a bunch of different things going on at once? And so I think that's the reason why if you were taking care of this patient, you would have taken good care of him because you're thinking about everything. And he did have everything. And he did. Yeah. So for this patient, for his course with the Kaposin, he was treated with liposomal doxorubicin and ART. He eventually developed a fever, progressive hypoxemia, a repeat broad workup, again, was essentially negative. He was intubated on hospital day 14. 
There was a bronc that was bloody, cloudy, and mucopurulent. He had progressive multi-organ failure, and family ultimately agreed with no escalation of care, and he passed away on hospital day 49. Oh, wow. So kind of a sad, sad outcome for this patient. So he was discharged home and then came back with... Mm -hmm. Yeah, this makes me think about the point that you made about HIV being a chronic illness that you can manage with if you have a patient who's compliant and have good medication adherence, but it is, but it does not, it's not saying that it's not a serious disease and again, goes, uh, go down spiral really quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And requires the means to have good follow-up too. For sure. So why don't we talk a little bit about Kaposi sarcoma then? This is great for me to review too. So Kaposi sarcoma is a low-grade vascular tumor. It's associated with HHV8, like we saw in this patient. Usually it's cutaneous lesions, so the one that this patient had on his thigh and in the oropharynx. But you can get more visceral involvement, especially if it's more progressed. So the lung and the GI tract, and even more in the oral cavity. Thinking about staging for AIDS-related Kaposi sarcoma, some of the things that have a worse prognosis would be if it's extensive oral Kaposi sarcoma, if there's GI involvement, if there is a CD4 count less than 200, which we never got this patient's CD4 count, if there's a history of thrush, any B symptoms, and then other HIV-related illness like neurologic disease or lymphoma. Thinking about treatment for Kaposi sarcoma, there's a lot of different approaches, and it really also depends on how extensive a disease the patient has. So there's some local therapies, intralesional chemotherapy, radiation, and some topicals, and then systemic chemotherapy. And that's what this patient ended up getting, the liposomal doxorubicin. And so really most important thing for a patient with Kaposi sarcoma and who's not on ART would be start ART. Mm -hmm. And then you want to add systemic chemotherapy for widespread skin involvement, extensive lesions that aren't responsive to local treatment, symptomatic visceral involvement, which this patient certainly has. And then immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome is also an indication. Does that sound familiar at all? I learned yeah, about that looking, looking this up, so I can share too. It's like my vague memory is when, like when you have HIV, like you have no good functioning immune system for a while. And then as soon as you rev things back up, you kind of like, overreact almost. I guess I think of it like how autoimmune diseases, yeah. it's like you're being way too reactive. And then just the sheer burden of like how much is going on with the immune system and like fighting against like infections that you may have. You may have had latent infections that you're like, you were not mounting a response to. And then someone like him who has every single bug that you could have responding to all of those all at once is just a lot to handle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that was a an awesome explanation. Upon some of my further re- reading, sounds like there's there's two kinds of, we call it iris, so immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So there's paradoxical iris. So this is worsening of a known opportunistic infection that may have been improvement, that had been improving with treatment. Or there's unmasking iris. And so that would be new signs or symptoms. And this is more of an occult infection that arises once you restart ART. And in particular for Kaposi sarcoma, initiating antiretroviral therapy is associated with progression of Kaposi sarcoma within three to six weeks after starting. And so that's when you really want to think about that systemic chemotherapy in addition. Any other learning points you want to share, Kevin? Yeah, I just, I think because we talked about some cat stuff, I just wanted to <laughs> to highlight bacillary angiomatosis versus Kaposi sarcoma, I feel like it's a, p- a fun test question that always gets asked. And it, without the right history, it really is a histopath diagnosis. There's something about like neutrophilic. Yeah. Nice. Well, it's coming back to you. Yeah. <laughs> Step one. <laughs> yeah. So one being 
BA is infectious and Kaposi's is malignant. So Bartonella causes BA. It's vasoproliferative lesions, usually spread by arthropod to our like furry friends. Other diseases associated with Bartonella are endocarditis, cat scratch, trench fever. And then it, differentiating the two really comes down to biopsy. So Kaposi's you see slit-like vascular spaces with lymphoplasmacytic inflammation. So there's an abundance of plasma cells, whereas BA has neutrophilic inflammation and capillary proliferation. Then if you want to get real fancy, you can do that starry stain and try to <laughs> find the Martin. I think differentiating the two becomes important because the treatment's very different. Like <laughs> one is antibiotics. They're doxy deficient. You got to give them some doxy. Yeah. Whereas the other, we're talking systemic chemotherapy, right? Yeah. So tissue was the issue when you're differentiating <laughs> the two. But I think just wrapping up this case, this was a really good discussion on a really complex patient. I think you guys handled it really well. You stayed so broad for so long, which is really hard to do. I think we could have easily focused on the eye. We could have easily focused on just the odynophagia component. Mm -hmm. I feel like there was a lot of distracting elements to the case too, but ultimately the answer came down to be this person had a lot of things going on. But what was probably the most prominent was the Kaposi sarcoma. And I think you guys kept that in mind the whole time. I'm really impressed. I'm sure our listeners will be too. And I learned a lot through from this case. I'm sure you guys did. Lauren did a great job putting all of this together. And then I think before we wrap up, just any final reflections you guys had? No, oh, you know who's the ID person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it always strikes me that every time there's a case conference and someone has HIV, then it's always things go downhill really fast. Yeah. Or it's the reverse. Someone comes in super, super, super sick. And then the answer is HIV. So I feel like it's a good reminder that like the medications we have are amazing. We always have to keep in mind that HIV can still do a lot of damage and, you That's know, a great we need to be, you know, we need to make sure that people are on it and that we're doing what we can for that. I feel like especially our training is in this work has been made with HIV where we're seeing patients in the chronic disease phase, more or less the acute and then complications of HIV. Whereas like a lot of the attendings we work with, their training was during the HIV yeah. epidemic yeah. where they were seeing like the PJP presentation of mm -hmm. HIV as being like the first diagnosis. So two, two ends of the spectrum. And I think your, you, your point really highlights how we got to stay grounded and remember what this can really do. Mm -hmm. Because definitely now, if I see like on someone's problem list, like HIV, I really just look, oh, are, you know, are they on medication and following up? Like, great. Yeah. But I don't think of it so much as like, oh, this is going to be a killer. Yeah. As I think like maybe older attendings probably would. Yeah. Well said. Anything from you, Lauren? No, I just think you both did a fantastic job. It was so great to work through this case with you and just to hear your, your clinical reasoning. And again, just makes me very proud to be your class. <laughs> so thanks so much for joining. Yeah. Uh, thank you for putting that fun case together. Yeah. <laughs> and and reminding me that cat scratch and <laughs> basilar angiomatosis are two different things. Yeah. So I just kept calling one the other. I know. I know. I see you. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks again for listening. Person, time, and place. See you next time.